So, once upon a time, I wrote a review about Remnant from the Ashes. To keep a long story short, I absolutely loved it. The entire premise, the gameplay, the weapon variety, the builds, the DLCs, all the modes, all the bosses. It would have been my favourite game of all time, if not for one mortal drawback, the bugs. No matter how enthusiastically I booted up, no matter how many hours I sank into it, no matter how many times I co-opted with a few friends and several beers, the game was borderline unplayable. Audio bugs, visual bugs, game-breaking bugs, instantly dying when walking through fog doors, randomly falling through the map, frame rate freezes during bullet hell bosses, every problem you can imagine plagued every single playthrough I did. Especially in the roguelike survival mode, which required a streak of 10 successful bosses, an attempt almost always thwarted by bugs. Having to leave a co-op game, let my co-op partner walk through a door, wait for the loading screen to pass and rejoin the game on the other side because otherwise the game would break, weird crashes and save file corruption, restarts, reloads, re-rolls, broken, broken, and broken. If it wasn't for that, it would have been one of my favourite games ever. And considering my undying love for the game, my infinite appreciation, my adoration despite the glitches, I constantly reiterated, I loved this game. But I could barely play it, and I can't ignore that. It was the most disappointing gaming experience of my life, and as a result, I couldn't write a review without grieving that. It went down poorly with the Remnant community very poorly. Turns out they're a very blindly loyal fanbase, and now, sitting as my most disliked video of all time, with well over 50% dislikes, and naturally the classic, well, I don't get any bugs so you're lying, response. I have to wonder who actually listened to the meat of my review. I loved Remnant. I love Remnant. But it's broken, and that impacted my experience so much that I could only be disappointed. Every new update, every new DLC added new bugs, and once the devs were done with it, they kicked it to the curb, never to patch it again. It's still broken, in some ways more so than it was when I played it. I went back to it recently and found that I die on every teleporter now, I can't co-op with my friends without crashes and infinite loading screens, and weird audio bugs occasionally blow my headset to pieces when sound effects randomly stack and then play all at once. And that's it, that's the state they left it in, never to address it again. But I still love it, and I made that review because I wish it had been better. Why do I bring up that review, do you ask? Why do I dwell on it? Because it was an amazing idea with good execution, but it was so neglected, so churned out, and so haphazardly smacked together that it was a shell of its potential. And Final Fantasy VII, to me, was the opposite. I've never seen such a beautiful game that did so little, such a well-crafted, gorgeous experience that padded its runtime for hours and hours, held my hand tight and refused to let me off its strict linear track, and did absolutely nothing with the clearly millions of dollars of budget poured into it. I pondered for a while over writing this, I don't want to be needlessly negative, it just wasn't my thing, but I still have a lot I'd like to say and it's a good exercise in creative writing, so please enjoy the following, my overall impressions of Final Fantasy VII. And in the spirit of trying to not be such a colossal killjoy about a game a lot of people really enjoy, I've decided to dampen my usual furious enthusiasm by preceding every criticism I have with something I loved about the game, so buckle up. To cut a long story short, I'd like to present to you five things I liked and five things I disliked about Final Fantasy VII. And Yami, nerd? Maybe duck out for this one. As far as compliments go, this is a fairly generic one. Good enemies are the I love food, music and travel, wow I'm so unique of dating profiles, but I'd say it's a major factor being that combat is one of the only things you can do outside of a cutscene in this game, and so enemies are a huge factor in actually making that entertaining. Including bosses, the game features 103 enemy types, ranging between the bipedal to the quadrupedal to the centipedal? The armoured to the naked, the fire, the ice, the lightning, so on and so forth. Sure, they return to some of the tried and tested staples of gaming, the trooper specifically, just another rendition of the classic guy with a gun trope, but troopers can have different elements and armours, meaning that you still have to focus on strategy even when fighting the most basic enemies. Some of them, like the shock troopers, are really fucking irritating as well, which adds an added element of fury. The quadrupedal enemies all seem to share an identical bank of animations, especially the pounce attack which I quickly came to despise, but what can you expect really? No need to reinvent the wheel, hence why FromSoft did about 18 different versions of Sif the Great Grey Wolf before they finally figured out some different ways to animate four-legged beasts and struck gold again with Medea. Seth? 
Another classically underdeveloped enemy is the mechanical enemy. If there's anything to criticise Nier Automata, and far beyond me to suggest such a heresy of course, but I'm sure there's probably a trickle of criticism if you dig deep enough, the robots in that game were quite samey. During the tutorial in the factory I remember thinking, wow these robots are really uninspired. I suppose they're supposed to resemble training dummies. Once I leave the tutorial area I bet I'll get to see all the amazing enemy designs that this game is known for. And then I left the tutorial and I realised that the robots, bar a few differences in mechanics and appearance are the ones that I'm slugged with for the rest of the game. Wasn't ideal. Not in Final Fantasy VII though. Final Fantasy VII spends most of its time in factories, underground facilities and metal jungle slums, meaning that thematically most of its bosses will be of a similar persuasion. Still, Square Enix does a good job of making sure every big metal robot boss is distinctive enough to stand out from its robot cousins. The Scorpion has a namesake tail with a love of ground pounding butt EMPs. The Arsenal is a smorgasbord of guns, has the capacity to destroy the environment and a very spiteful streak. The Hell House is, well, I mean, Google it if you haven't seen it. It's probably the roughest part of the hard playthrough and I don't really want to discuss it any further. Beyond that, there's still a lot of memorable variety present in the game. The final boss is half cutscene, half spectacle boss, but honestly he looks fantastic, like a giant storm atronach in the three Mass Effect ending colours. And then there's the final, final boss, but I'd stopped paying attention by then so it was just a 1v1 with some guy. I'll talk a little about the Shinra VR missions later, but the final one, a whopping 40 minute gauntlet to be unlocked after finishing all the Colosseum matches, battle intel reports and other VR missions features a gauntlet of five great bosses one after the next. Shiva, Fat Chocobo, Leviathan, Bahamut and the Pride and Joy prototype, all hugely distinctive bosses with their own gimmicks, weaknesses, strategies and approaches. I both loved and hated this one, an absolute wind up in the sheer amount of time it took just to get to Bahamut, but a huge exultation when you finally won. Good stuff. These are all bosses you can earn as summons during the main game too, which adds an extra layer of familiarity and consequently betrayal when they wipe the floor with you 27 minutes in. Speaking of gimmicks and strategies, they really begin to pan out in the later difficulties. Enemies like the Marlboro can cast status effects like Silence, which prevents spell casting and really shafts you in harder fights. Some enemies like the Phantoms can shift between being immune to magic and melee respectively, making for an interesting switch in approach throughout the fight. All enemies have varying weaknesses, be them elemental, melee or magic based. All these weaknesses need to be exploited in harder difficulties when stagger damage becomes a make or break aspect of any conflict, and essentially the sole way you do any damage at all. There's drakes, weird failed experiments, ghosts and phantoms, rodents and all sorts. Every level has distinctive enemies, often being the standout detail of any place you explore which is again good considering the reliance this game's gameplay has on combat. One particular enemy of note was the Tonbri, a smooth Yoda dolphin hybrid if that's something you can imagine, who crawls around the arena at a snail's pace with a truckload of HP and a hilarious one shot kill move, chef's knife. He's like the assassin in Snail, following you around the arena while you focus on bigger enemies, only to strike when you've basically forgotten he's there. On tireder attempts, when the tilt was rising and I was making stupid mistakes, he and his buds would sweep my team and I'd have to go for a walk. One shot kill moves become a tiredly hilarious phenomenon the further you crawl into hard mode, particularly Bahamut's Mega Flare with a terrifying countdown from 5 that culminates in an almost scripted one shot kill. You can counter it with barrier, which I love, but we'll get more to the real meat of this game, the strategy, later on. One of the limitations I mentioned above is how difficult I imagine it was to contrive anything beyond Big Robot Man, as any of the bosses in Final Fantasy VII, considering the samey nature of most of the maps, and I want to talk about that a little bit more now. I genuinely feel as though so much of this game takes place in so many similar places, just so that they could get away with copy pasting the same assets over and over again, to the point where navigating is confusing and indiscernible. We've got corrugated metal, we've got rusty metal, we've got scrap metal, we've got water pipes, we've got steam pipes, we've got ladders, and metal walkways and metal shipping containers. We've got concrete floors, we've got concrete walls, we've got broken concrete floors and broken concrete walls. Concrete walls with a bit of paint on it, concrete walls without. Metal stairs, concrete stairs, rails, metal fencing, big control panels, small control panels, so on and so forth just copy pasted to oblivion. I know it's a remake of the original and they used a lot of the original settings but they also padded the fuck out of this in so many places so they always could have padded the fuck out of the visuals too. You'd expect some more creative 
creative liberties to not really be that much of a problem. Probably saved a bit of cash, but as a result only a few moments in the game outside of cutscenes are memorable. Sure, there are a few boss fights you'll remember, and a few slaps of scenery you might walk away with, but chapters 3 to 16, with the exception of 9, tend to blur together really badly. It all looks the same. I don't think it's a coincidence that Final Fantasy VII takes you through a factory, some slums, another factory, an underground facility, a laboratory, some more slums, then ruined versions of the above. Sure, there are a few really unique locales like the Sector 7 slums with Corneo's mansion, Shinra HQ and Aerith's house, but on the whole it's undeniable how similarly designed everywhere is in a way that allows the dev team almost infinite reuse of the core design components in the game, which again, I don't think is a coincidence. Often you spend ages running back and forth because the map isn't extremely useful and you're not quite sure what you've explored and what you haven't yet. Especially with the way the map is static, it's on a set compass perspective with north always at the top, which other games have taught me isn't typically always an issue, but it doesn't synergize well with the super windy nature of many of the map. You'll head towards your objective and just end up running into dead ends or going in circles, constantly having to check the map and tilt your head to try and understand which convoluted list of twists and turns you'll need to make just to get vaguely where you're supposed to be going. From a user experience perspective, navigation is one of the most fundamental aspects of any game and it shouldn't be like trying to decipher the Da Vinci code just to figure out how to get to the closest materia shop. Needless friction between your user and the most basic aspects of gameplay is only going to annoy and repel, not be a hurdle people want to try and overcome. They just move on to something easier. It should be seamless, done completely without thought or effort, and in the case of this particular navigation style, it just didn't synergize very well. I feel like a dotted waypoint route system would have worked much better, or a compass that turned to face the direction your character was facing. All the while you're running past brown haired NPCs with the most inane dialogue you've ever heard. Most often it's redundant and a bit weird, very useless, but also not like a casual overheard conversation either. Maybe a mistranslation issue, but ultimately I found it unwelcome. No clues about the quest you're doing, no wider information about the world you're in, no flavour, no intrigue, no rumours or comments or gossip, just random bollocks. I guess it's realistic, but I don't play games to listen to other people's inner monologues. Especially in situations where you're following the girls around, it's creepy and cringe, but more on that later. For now. If you'd have told me my angriest moment in recent history would be over an effeminate man called Jules doing pull-ups in the gym, I'd have told you to fuck off. Well, I probably wouldn't, but you know, for posterity's sake, I'd have at least thought it as I rolled my eyes and smiled obligingly at you. Hidden in plain sight, in a gym in the Sector 7 slums, Jules offers an optional quest the likes of which you've never seen, and if you're going for the Platinum Trophy, it's mandatory. This strange pull-up rhythm game has three levels, trainee, amateur, and pro. It goes from 0 to 100 in about 3 seconds and is notorious for being one of the most hair-tearing experiences in all of JRPGs. It's a jumped up rhythm game that requires you to tap buttons in specific sequences at increasing speeds, but if you go too fast and tap too quickly, your character will slip off the pole and fall, while your opponent flies along beside you. Jules must be on gear or something, because he just gets faster and faster, he'll even fall off once or twice and will still go on to go faster than you. If you've not reached a certain number of pull-ups before the halfway point, you may as well just restart and go again. Still, it's fresh and it's new and it's memorable, and yeah, it might have given me heart palpitations and I might have said some things to Tifa I regret, but I'm proud of that trophy and it's at least a conversation piece. Seriously though, it is enraging. I know I'm not the only person who went batshit at their own monitor. There's a lovely little darts game with some questionable accuracy, but it's a sweet break from factory farming and side questing and bookends some of the earlier chapters in the game with something lighthearted that can be practiced and refined. There's also a trophy for it, so naturally it was of peak importance to me on my Final Fantasy journey. There's also two mini games requiring you to move quickly through the small map, destroying boxes where worth lots and lots of points. You have to be careful of which moves you're using at which time, which stance you're in, and how many points you'll be risking for putting extra time in certain routes, versus how quickly you can rack up points through various combos. It takes a few attempts to get right, but it's the perfect combination of challenge and skill, requiring practice and route perfection to get it down pat each time. Finally, we've got the dance show, and there's nothing to say about that at all. To give you an idea of how much of a helicopter parent this game is, Final Fantasy VII won't even let you jump in or out of combat. Rather than make a cohesive environment and playtest it to ensure players can't get out of bounds, the game just won't let you jump. No jumping, no trust to jump. I suppose it's a solution to a problem of accidentally breaking the game, but you're sinking the ship to kill the captain here a little bit. It's not the end of the world that your character can't jump, but it does feel weirdly constrictive, especially when you want to hop over a small set of tables and chairs to go the quick way around a building, but you can't. And while your character will typically jump to hit flying enemies, they're not very good at recognising enemies that have scaled walls, so often you'll be smashing 
square at the foot of a wall just watching your character flail around awkwardly until the ATB gauge grows and they can fire off a B-rate spell. During one late game parkour session as Tifa, you must jump across several lampshades. However, the game doesn't let you jump, it also doesn't let you fall off. You simply hold forward on the analogue stick, Tifa will shuffle around the edge of a lampshade, balancing precariously, she will stand on the jump arrow, she will automatically jump. You can't jump anywhere else, you can't fall off the side, you can't jump between different lampshades, this is literally a push forward and win gameplay loop. After a certain point, Tifa will fall off in a scripted segment. At this point, you have to stand up and climb up pieces of furniture, again, pressing forward on arrows on the furniture so that Tifa jumps for you. Again, it's impossible to fall off. Tifa will hop up to a metal lighting grid and monkey bar across, again, unable to fall off, only able to climb up and drop down on the this is the answer arrows. Ladders and doors can only be passed through by standing on very specific arrows, you can't do it yourself. It's a glorified cutscene. Like, this game is so desperate for you to see Tifa in one way, a sort of this is her story first and your game second, that it will not let you play it in the way you want to any capacity. It won't let you fail and retry for the sake of making her look bad. You can only watch her play her story. It could have been a cutscene, in fact it could have been a JPEG. Why let me play this segment if there's no stakes or challenge? I guess maybe it was initially supposed to be a cutscene, but that particular chapter is particularly bogged down with them, so they made it a gameplay segment to split it up a little bit. Either way, it's a really patronising bit of gameplay. Something easier than a quick time event, but harder than a skip cutscene button. The game doesn't trust you with any freedoms at all, which comes across as overly cautious at best and straight out condescending at worst. There's even a false sense of looting. In some areas you just can't swing your sword, and in other areas you can, and in those areas there are boxes with just some random shit in it. In fact, I don't think it's possible to have 10 minutes of gameplay without another cutscene being rammed down your throat, to the point where it becomes an annoying routine of pressing square a bit to attack, getting a cutscene so long that you have to put the controller down for 5 minutes to watch, the cutscene ends, you walk for a bit or fight a couple of enemies, and then you watch another cutscene. This game is prone to those classic, sudden, insurmountable problem cutscenes too. I can mow down enemies all day, but those same enemies will absolutely wipe the floor with me in a cutscene. My strength as an individual doesn't count, and I know that that criticism can be levied against a lot of different games, but I feel like Final Fantasy's story is crammed into hours and hours of cutscenes, with gameplay segments reluctantly wedged between them. If you skip cutscenes, you can finish the game in half the time. I'd say maybe they take up more than half of the game's playtime? If you like that, then fine, that's your taste, that's no problem. But I find it boring and redundant. Just make a film if you don't want me to have any input in what happens or why. And input is absolutely the key term here. So many times during the game you'll be faced with a question you can choose the answer to, like take a drink or don't take a drink. If you say no, Tifa makes you a drink anyway in a boundless disregard for consent, disguised as an adorably peppy manic pixie dream girl move. Sure, there's one instance where your answer dictates which quest you get and consequently which dress Cloud wears in chapter 9, but on the whole it's the classic JRPG token question so you can pretend like you're role playing in a game that won't even let you jump. Nice one. On to something now that I really enjoyed about the game. I want to turn your attention to the Colosseum, the Battle Intel reports, and the Shinra VR station. These are three lists of combat-based achievements to earn in-game, sometimes with rewards. Usually these rewards are just harder missions, but since these are so fun it only suits to do more. Battle Intel reports are probably the most interesting of the three, given by a small bloke called Chadley. The Intel reports are a list of challenges that require you to kill specific enemies, understand weaknesses and advantages, and exploit them. Essentially, you'll take on as many report tasks as available, and go off into the world. The great thing about them is that you can track them alongside the other side and main missions available to you, allowing you to tackle them in the same vein as things like daily challenges. Once you complete a certain amount, you're permitted to go fight a boss, and once they're all done, it contributes to the total required to go fight the ultimate secret boss of the game, Bahamut and the Pride and Joy prototype by proxy. The Colosseum and Shinra VR are far more direct combat, essentially a set of fights for specific characters to take on, i.e. Aerith vs Shinra Thugs, Tifa vs Shinra Thugs, Barret vs Shinra thugs, etc. But with a bunch of different enemies and bosses and such. They're really fun, although my personal pet peeve with them is that you only get a very small window to tackle them. Aerith's, for example, is only available after beating a gauntlet of Colosseum bosses as part of the main story in chapter... 8? nine as part of the main story. And I remember by that point I was sick to death of them because I'd had to do four in a row, so I decided to come back at a later point to do Aerith's challenges, only to realise I'd missed the 40 second window you're permitted, so I had to come back later with mission select and play through the whole first part of that chapter and do the first gauntlet, just to be able to have a go at Aerith's abilities. If it was available as part of chapter select after the main story, just to tackle Colosseum and Shinra missions without having to do all the extra work, I'd much prefer that. The missions are really good, especially as you work your way into the Shinra VR mission 
missions, which force you to learn and adapt to the combat system to make the best of the situation. One mission, for example, is a really tough gauntlet of mechanical elemental enemies, such as shock troopers and moth units. This one is an absolute pain in the arse, until you learn you can infuse your armour with thunder materia, at which point you'll absorb all electric damage as health and can essentially use them as free health potion every time they try and damage you, thus making it a cakewalk. There's loads of great stuff like this, including enemies that pepper you with status effects, like the Malbra, an enemy you can kill after beating nearly all the missions in the game, whose ability Bad Breath is an absolute pain in the arse, but only adding an element of fun that offers a huge amount of challenge. Particularly being that he squats right at the end of a hard mode 5 boss gauntlet, meaning that if he bad breaths you to death you have to start right at the beginning again. Every attempt you make at the gauntlet is trial and error. You lose, you step back, you tweak your builds, you try again until you have it. He's not too hard when tackled with the right combination of materia, but it might take a while for you to figure out the perfect combination. One particularly gruelling trial involves you tackling the infamous Bahamut, weirdly the penultimate boss in a nasty 5 boss gauntlet, ending in the much easier Pride and Joy prototype. He's a Yu-Gi-Oh looking dragon style boss with a DPS check foreshadowed with a 5 to 1 countdown that he slowly and terrifyingly works down over the course of a few meteor laden minutes of gameplay. You'll figure out your own strategies for beating him as you go, revival earrings, barrier materia, DPS stagger, but just as with the Marlborough he requires a dirty gauntlet run to practice again. He's preceded by Shiva, a fat chocobo and a leviathan, the latter of which takes fucking decades to kill, so you'll be near 30 minutes of fighting before you get a chance at him, which is probably the most demoralising part of it. Either way, it's a brilliant little segment of Final Fantasy VII and probably the place where the gameplay is best used and the build system really comes into its own. So, I wrote tons of notes for this section, but honestly the knowledge that I could be as articulate as I need to be about this and still have frothing fanboys in the comments telling me I just don't understand how women behave, despite being one for the last 25 years, is looming over me like a toxic gas. I almost didn't make this video at all because I know how militant the waifu community is for this game and I knew I couldn't talk about it without discussing it. It's just a game, it's just fantasy, it's made for men, it's supposed to be for the male gaze. Women actually do really like it when you talk to them like shit. Naturally Cloud would attract women. He's only only vile and occasionally openly spiteful to them because he's shy. Women need direction, Aerith is supposed to be childlike, it's what makes her so attractive. Of course women would be flattered by catcalling and inappropriate comments on the street, yada yada yada, I couldn't give 10 shits. Instead, here are just some thoughts I had, please don't comment on my knowledge of women if you aren't one by the way. If I have to listen to another patchy bearded adolescent incel explain what they've learned about female psychology from binge watching anime and chronic masturbation, I'm gonna raise enough money to buy Square Enix, then personally shut it down, then no one gets a sequel so shut up. First of all, neither of those women would ever be attracted to Cloud in real life as soon as they heard him speak. Sure he's cute, but he's disinterested at best and openly rude to them at worst. I don't care if he's shy or doesn't understand social situations, he's a cunt, and unless these women have serious self esteem issues they'd know to steer clear. Aerith seems like she was supposed to have been characterised as sweet and innocent, but they pushed it too far and they just made her childlike. She talks like she doesn't know how to tie her shoelaces. She's slow, deliberate, absent minded, ignorant and aggressively stupid. I see a lot of people say they're on Team Aerith and I'd order a hard drive check on every single one of them if I could, because if you describe your ideal woman as childlike, then you're a nonce. Fuck off. Neither of these women are well or realistically categorised, like none of the writers have ever spoken to a bona fide roasty. Aerith's characterisation comes from a fat walk you do through the town where everyone comes over to tell her how generous and amazing she is, exploited for free labour at the local coffee shop or providing free herbs for the doctor. Yeah, you can say she's just really generous like that, but she's a 22 year old woman and she deserves to be compensated for her labour. It's ironic to have a storyline about Shinra's exploitation and then watch a girl with an IQ so low you can't be sure whether or not she's capable of consent, and explain that she works for free because she just loves to help others, like she has absolutely no dreams, aspirations for herself or absolutely zero self worth? Don't bitch at me like that's realistic either. Generous people deserve things too, you don't have to give everything you have in return for nothing just to be considered generous. She's the classic manic pixie dream girl trope, just bumbling along in life, not knowing how pretty she is, no motivations whatsoever in case it conflicts with your own, stupid, exploitable, with a free schedule, and somehow inexplicably into you. See my previous nonce point. Whenever you walk with either Tifa or Aerith, male NPCs around you will comment on them, how amazing they look, how much they give for a night with them, how sexy they are, how gorgeous they are, how lucky you are. It's probably the most pathetic male brain tingler I've ever seen, like it's not the grossest, most predatory thing for these women to be sized up by 20 plus people at any given time, like a rack of meat, just so you can feel proud to 
be the one they like. Because that's all it is. The game is trying to make you feel like Mummy's special boy for being favoured by two women that everyone else wants. Touch grass. I feel like JRPG protagonists are always written to be oblivious about women and kind of awkwardly fumble around, not really showing any interest in women at all. But this often has the weird consequence of backfiring badly, making it seem like they're actually just not interested in women. Like they aren't romantically or sexually attracted to women. I reckon that would have been a better angle to go with at this point. Just make Cloud gay and save me the trouble of sitting through another minute of awful dialogue and zero chemistry. Got to say, as a woman myself, short of near automata, this is probably the cringiest representation I've seen of my fellow sex in any game. Just brain dead, low self esteem women who drop absolutely everything on the spot for some turtleneck toting blonde who treats them like shit. I felt absolutely zero kinship with a single woman in this game because they just weren't women. They weren't written by women nor for women. Every choice they make is about cloud or for cloud, except one girl who has her own path ahead of her and then dies in a cutscene. They're just blow up dolls toddling around, ring at cloud, hanging onto his every word, just gross male gaze substitutes with nothing to them. Grade A cringe. I spent a lot of time growing up forgiving men who were horrible to me because of the boys will be boys adage. The amount of times I would be treated terribly by men only to hear, oh he just fancies you, he doesn't know how to show his emotions properly, gave me the most mixed feelings ever. To suffer abuse at some dickhead's hands and be told I needed to go easy on him because men are worse with emotions? It took a long time for me to unpack that pattern of forgiving, excusing and overlooking nasty behaviour. This game is just another piece of media that teaches women to accept horrible treatment from men because they need to forgive and nurture his arrested development. Oh, he seems cold and rude, but you need to fix him and bring him out of his shell. Women are not responsible for your emotional constipation. Yeah, he's 20 years old and he can't express his feelings properly. Yeah, that is a problem. And no, that's not on anyone but him to fix. Raise your standards, girls. If he's horrible to you all day and only occasionally sweet, he's not a nice person. This is your sign. Get out of there. Do not date a cloud. Anyway, onto a point that doesn't make me physically shrivel into myself like a knob on a frosty winter's morning. I love the builds in Final Fantasy VII. That being said, I do wish there were loadouts, but I understand that a team of four might be tricky to accomplish that with. But the builds are great. Characters' weapons get a number of materia slots that can be added to with upgrades to said weapon, plus their gear can provide extra slots and slots that combine to make peer materia stronger. This provides a really strong basis for complex and unique builds, being that you can pump your characters full of health and mana boosts, better blocks and parries and spells of all kinds. Each individual materia can be upgraded, usually three times, and can be toggled to during fights by pressing left and right in the ability menu. Some materia stack and can focus the abilities of others, and some materia can boost general stats, like the rate at which you earn XP. Characters can pick up new weapons with a slight difference in moveset, materia slots and stats. The weapon you use doesn't make or break your game, but it will occasionally provide a crucial advantage in a situation. It's like the straw that breaks the camel's back, except good, just stacking more and more little things in your favour until you break through the other side. You can even infuse your armour with elements to make you not only immune to that element but also absorb any damage taken as health instead. I really like this utility because it means there are loads of different ways to approach different fights. Even with Bahamut, the mighty DPS check, there are a million different ways to tackle him, be it a full DPS build in return or a nice and slow burn healing and revival team. It means that as you work through Shinra VR missions, the Colosseum, the battle intel reports, side quests and hard mode, you're constantly updating your build and toggling on what works and what doesn't. About to take on a metallic enemy? Infuse your armour with thunder to turn their greatest offence into your greatest defence. About to battle a humanoid enemy? Spec into counter stance to parry them to death. A long gauntlet coming up? Spec everyone with the prayer materia to keep healing for as long as possible. Unfortunately, with the previous coin comes a flip side. Well, I want to add a little caveat to that. I don't think that the combat system is good enough to make the most of the potential afforded by builds. I know that the remaster took the series away from turn-based combat, but honestly it's still glorified turn-based. You press square to do basic attacks until your ATB gauge fills up, you can only occasionally string moves together, but swapping between attacks, parries, blocks and attacks isn't something the game permits. It's one stiff, unfluid animation after another. Sure, you can string light attacks together, but nothing more. You can't cancel animations, even the transitions between animations like raising your arms, a tiny movement to block, can't be reversed until the block has been put up, and only then. You can't dodge roll unless you're in the blocking stance, which means you have to hold R1, Cloud will transition into his block stance, and then you can press circle to roll, which kind of defeats the point of dodging quickly. It just means that you awkwardly move from one action to one action, pressing square 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 square, occasionally slowly bringing up a block or a dodge, until your ATB gauge fills enough to do an attack. In hard mode, your standard 
standard square attacks are nearly useless. You have to wait until enemies are staggered and then hit them with your best moves, which just reeks of turn-based combat, but about 40 hours longer. This problem is especially exacerbated during the motorbike section, which has you rely on a charging triangle attack. On the bike, the ranged triangle attack is the only attack you use that actually does any damage, but it takes 10 seconds to arbitrarily recharge. There's absolutely zero reason why it needs to take 10 seconds to recharge. This means that you'll have two basic enemies driving in front of you within range able to be hit, each requiring two hits to kill, but you're waiting close to a minute to kill them. It's arbitrary, it's stupid, it's gameplay without value. This is the case especially with the later motorbike boss who cleverly drives to the side of your bike that your sword arm isn't on, forcing you to rely on a triangle spin attack to even hit him. You just hit him, wait ages for the move to recharge, hit him again, rinse and repeat. These sections add so little value to the game that you're even allowed to skip them after playing their respective missions one time, a move previously more or less unheard of as it basically admits that it's a shit chapter, so unworth your time that you may as well skip it. Like in a game that makes you fat walk whilst listening to Aerith talk about how she likes the taste of wax crayons for half an hour at a time, they deemed these entire segments of gameplay worth skipping. That's not a lot of faith in the only time they really tried to push the boat out gameplay wise. Another botched attempt at innovation, the robot hands segment, absolutely tripped and fell at the first hurdle. They're not impossible to use by any means, but they rely on the analogue sticks from the perspective of the hand, not the viewer, which is a fixed viewpoint, meaning they're not intuitive to pick up and use. Sure, if you've played it a bunch, if you're an advanced player, you'll come up to them with no problem, but it's hardly a seamless gameplay loop to pick up and adjust to. They have a very frustrating bounce off furniture when they hit it, which in my opinion is the worst idea for haptic feedback I've ever heard, and every time they break they sound like a low battery carbon monoxide alarm, which really frustrates me. Final Fantasy teaches you one lesson, which is just never try any anything new, ever. In a little-known indie gem titled The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, characters are uniquely characterised not only through how they speak and act, but through how they look. Characters are given individual bright and memorable colour schemes, aligning with their personalities. Philippa Eilhart wears royal reds and purples to denote her own royalty as head of the lodge. Kira Metz's colour scheme, to me, seems the colour of unusual flowers, vibrant, pretty and interesting. Yennefer is black and white, Dijkstra is gold, Roach is blue and white. All of them are absurdly memorable, even years after playing the game, most of the characters are recognisable and can even be recalled by name. The same goes for Final Fantasy VII. Years before I even touched the game for the first time, I knew who Aerith was. She's one of the most memorable characters in video game history. Same goes for Sephiroth and Tifa. Less so Barrett and weirdly Cloud, who I always assumed was called Sora. Might have gotten my wires crossed a little bit there. But I always could have told you that he was from Final Fantasy VII. Even Biggs and Wedge were memorable, despite the latter's personality being reduced completely to the phenomenon of being overweight. Even people like Tifa as landlady, the massage woman, the chocobo guy, you might not remember their name but you see them in a scene and you'll recognise them forever. Compared to current titles like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Dying Light and literally any Far Cry game, besides the multi-million dollar actor cameos of course, this is somehow some kind of niche art. I'm not some kind of absolute wankhead to call it dying, but it's definitely in short supply. Okay, so sex trafficking might be a bit hyperbolic, but the light-hearted wife audition plotline and arguably the most famous plotline in the game just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Some creepy mafia boss seems to go through women like Jammy Dodgers, red flag, and now he's holding auditions for a new wife, again, red flag. Anyway, Leslie guards the door and he warns you about how he wouldn't wish this fate on any of these women and that he prays that you turn around and you go. That's another red flag, by the way. The fact that he's seen the horrors of the life these women will go on to lead and he can't bring himself to pretend that it'll be worth while any longer. Like, yeah, I understand Corneo might have too much of a grip on the local community to directly rebel against him, but to join him and directly help him? Weak, Leslie. Weak. Yeah, it's all but stated that Leslie's wife was taken too, and I understand the town is owned by Corneo, but I don't quite know what Leslie assumes he can gain by working directly for him and doing nothing to sabotage or prevent the preventable deaths of these women. I mean, he still hosts and facilitates these auditions, vets entrance, and lets them in. So you could say he's just following orders, but it's not as if he's doing anything to stop 
stop whatever the fuck is going on. Same goes for the other three pillars of the community, the cowboy, the dance man and the kimono woman, who constantly mutter under their breath about how sorry they are for the poor women who get married off to Corneo, are almost immediately murdered, and their bodies thrown into the sewer to feed Abzu, along a whole host of other foul things the game implies happens to them. And you engage with these people. You help them, you pay for their massages, run errands for them, do dance numbers with them. It's not even like you stay neutral, you willingly assist a group of people who are just following orders, for no purpose other than getting Tifa out of a bad situation she walked into to get someone else out of a bad situation, or to collect information, or something. It was a weird duckling line of strange decisions and plot contrivances. And the punchline is that Cloud wears a dress? Wow, nuanced. See, if you don't want to tackle dark subject matter, or if you don't think you're equipped to handle dark subject matter, sex, trafficking, rape, murder, these are all the implied ends of Corneo's victims, and the only thing that culminates from it is that Cloud wears a dress and gets picked, and it's implied he's assaulted too. But he's a man, so it's funny. Well done, Square Enix. I know this is a remake of a game from an ignorant time, but if they can pad the story with 40 hours of anime gasps, redundant exposition, and silly busy work, they can alter some of the details in Corneo's rape brigade. And that's all I'm saying. People lost their mind when Tifa's tits got nerfed pre-release, they can care about this. So, those are my thoughts on Final Fantasy VII, in a medium as balanced as I could possibly manage. Who'd have thought I'd ever be so balanced about a game I fundamentally didn't enjoy? Not me. I've always been more of a trophy hunter type, hopping from game to game rather than committing to individual series, so we can appreciate that my disinterest in this title might have been largely affected by my previous lack of interest in JRPGs and the like. I appreciate less of a hands-on, cutscene-heavy title, so I found the constant stop and start to be really frustrating. I can appreciate I'm an unreliable narrator here with that predisposition, but I also felt like the perspective of someone not already keen on JRPGs might at least offer something else. Mechanically, I liked it. Narratively, I hated it. I'm sure you have your own thoughts and opinions on this title, so please let me know how you found the game yourself. What do you think of my points? Do you agree or disagree? I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. If you stuck around this far, thank you for your patience. I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and if so, please give this video a like and subscribe to me here on YouTube. Also, please head over to my Twitch channel where I broadcast trophy hunting gameplay several times a week. Again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.